Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Hi, I, I'm Norm Wright. Um, I, I work uh, for USC, um, and I'm going to try to do some uh, some functional training uh, around type state configuration. Um, and so the, the first thing, sort of just sort of understanding, the, there's sort of a presumption of that, that most people or everybody has sort of gone through at least a little bit of understanding or introduction to Kuali, and in particular, um, the services primer. And so they have basic understanding of you know what services are, why we're using services, what's a class one service, what's a class two service. You know, so when I use those terms, um, you know, I, I don't think you'll be don't if you haven't uh, done that, but it certainly you know would give you a lot more background and understanding as to what we're doing. Um, and then there's an, another one which sort of gives you some more background about sort of why we're doing. Whoops. So, um, <clears throat> but I've got slides to go through, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through pretty fast. If people could, um, you know, then maybe put the Skype chat and say slow down or something like that, and somebody would let me know that I need to slow down um, because there's a lot of slides to get through here. So, in any case, um, you know, so so uh, there's a lot of things we're trying to just do here, and you know, a lot of it is there's been some some confusion swirling around as to what these things are, what they're doing, who does what, how does it work, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's why I'm doing this training is to sort of get you know sort of everybody. Uh, on the same page and sort of understanding at least uh, from what we've been doing from the services team about how we're managing types and what we're thinking about types and how we how we conceive types and whatnot and why they're even there in the first place. Um, but then there's some real practical objectives here also is that um, especially because this is primarily a dev a dev uh, group hopefully um, that we really want to talk about sort of you know how do you actually add something to this because um, one of the things uh, as you'll see is that we don't really want to be in a position where the services is the bottleneck. Uh, for defining types and states and new groupings and stuff like that. So, um, so first of all, types. Um, you know, what is a quality student type? And you know, it, it it really is exactly what what the, as a developer you might be thinking is is that it's really sort of a way to do that inheritance structure that that Java has. But we we wanted to do it in a way and to ha and to surface that in a way that that actually could be remoted easily. Um, and so, you know, we have web services, and, and yes, we could have serialized. I'm gonna, this is really techy because I'm just talking to a techy audience. We could have serialized Java objects back and forth to do all that inheritance. But instead, what we decided instead is just to name a field in the object and call it a type, and then say that that's going to control what type of uh, sub-object this thing is. So it allow us to be able to do just some basic uh, inheritance that we want to be able to do in the system. Um, I hope that makes sense to the developers. Uh, um, and, and so, you know, and why does it have it in the first place? You know, Quali Student was originally envisioned, um, and, and a lot of the, the, the driving force behind it was because um, schools were, were sort of hamstrung by the hard-coded definitions of, of courses and, and majors and minors and whatnot, and, and, they, and they increasingly had professors who were wanting to offer courses that weren't really courses that, that were, you know, as an example here, service learning or, 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 or they were um, other kinds of experiences that, that, that were sort of academic in nature and whatnot, and they wanted to be able to model them. So when we, when we started this whole thing, they started off very carefully saying we really need to be able to sort of create things that are, that are more, more abstract so we can more easily then model um, a professor who wants to, you know, uh, offer a course over spring break where he takes all the students to the Amazon, those kind of things. So... In any case, so it, and it's really intended for, for, for that purpose, to, to allow us to model things more easily and, and for schools to add in their own kind of types later on. Um, you know, so then the, the quick question is, well, okay, is this so unique to KS? And it really isn't. I mean, it, 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 it's actually a common problem, and it's a common in a lot of other places and, and you know, uh, systems that use this thing. And in fact, Quali Rice uses them. Um, and so if you sort of look at the Kim Identity Services, they have affiliation types, they have address types, they have phone types, they have all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, rice types, that, you know, so they're used similarly to Kuali Student, but you know, there's a little bit of differences in how they manage them. They don't have the same naming patterns and whatnot. And, and, and they also have other kinds of mechanisms for, uh, given a particular type, how does it affect the actual operation of what's going on. But, you know, it, it's not a completely new thing to Kuali, to Kuali Student. We didn't invent the idea. Um, and what's a little different in there, though, is, is, is that, you know, in Quali Student, we, we took it really seriously in the sense that, you know, we said, well, geez, everything then we're going to put on that object is, is a type and state. And I said almost everything, because there are a couple of them that we don't put, put types and states on. 
But almost every object that you find in the system, there's a type and a state. Um, and in fact, our new methodology, what we're following is we actually don't sort of ask, is there a type on the, on the object? We stick a type on the object. We stick a state on the object. And we figure out later on what, what are those types and states? What are they really used for? And, I, and you, know, you can read the example there, but this really comes in really handy. Um, there, there, there's another example that we just, we just came up with, which was um, you know, we had modeled these uh, registration appointment windows. And then we, we found that one of the use cases was, well, how do we define a one-off appointment? You know, a manually have the professor, I mean, uh, the uh, administrator create an a, 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 a appointment window just for this student. And lo and behold, sort of like, okay, well, easy. We create a new type. It's called the manual type. And it's a way that you manually, you, instead of the, the window creating the, the appointments um, automatically, it's, the, it's done manually. And the person types in the type and the date and time, and that's how it's done. And again, so it's allowed, it made it very easy to, be able to add in additional functionality without, without having to sort of like go, oh, gosh, we need to add a manual flag to this thing. We need to end allow, you know, all that kind of stuff. It just rolls off. So once you get going, it really just, just flies. Um, so then, <clears throat> so then you know, OK, we, we can type these things, but what can they really do? Sort of in Java, you know, developers know you can change all kinds of things. You can override methods. You can sort of in, in, implement you know, different behavior of the object and whatnot. Well, you know, these things are just, you know, strings that are, you know, stored on the object. But then, you know, we do use them in different ways to control the processing of, of, of those, all the objects. Um, so, you know, one of the things, is, as you can see there, is uh, t you can turn on and off different fields that are, that are on the object um, based on either its representation at the class 2 level or via the dictionary. So the dictionary can say, you know, this field is required or it's not allowed depending on the type, the, the value of, in the type field or the value in the state field. Um, the other thing is, is that very often, you know, since they, the, the types form groupings of, of these objects, uh, you can use them very a lot for selecting them. You sort of say, well, give me the, 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 all of the milestones that are of the type holiday. Um, and you could then pull them up, and you can then, say, display them on a, on a calendar. Um, most important, and especially now that we're in enrollment, but this was actually long time ago, was it allows us to, do, to write a business rule that applies to all instances of, of that type. And so you're allowed to you then write in logic that doesn't say, well, this is true for, for this semester. And then it's also semester of 2000, fall 2012 and fall 2013. You can just write it once and sort of say, OK, this is true for this semester. And this, this, this milestone of this type drop date or whatever. And be able to, to write that logic efficiently and apply it over a whole period of instances. Um, the last thing is, and we just haven't gotten this all figured out yet, is that it can also be used very strongly to drive uh, authorization. So it can control who can update different pieces of you know, different, different objects in the system. So we have, don't have the actual details of the mechanism worked out, but it's there. Um, so, of course, you know, if, if you're a Java programmer and you're thinking, okay, well, hey, you know, they, they should be like hierarchical because that's sort of what Java is, but no, they're not. Um, again, this, this previous incarnation of the service team decided not to do that, and I, I don't ever second guess what sort of gone before me. I sort of just deal with what we've got. Um, but the nice thing is, is that instead they, they allowed uh, types to be grouped in different ways. And so you sort of get some of that same effect of being able to sort of like categorize things in different ways for different purposes. And you can sort of put, put a bunch of different, for example, a bunch of different milestone types into different categories. Or you can sort of say all these milestone types are for holidays or events or for key dates or whatever. Um, and they can also then be regrouped for all kinds of different purposes, for different display purposes and, and defaulting purposes. Um, it, and we've set up this, this generic structure that it should allow you to be able to actually define different groups for whatever the application really wants to be able to do to manipulate all of the types that are in, uh, objects of those types in the system. Um, and you know, I, I just want to make a real strong point here. You know, services team doesn't want to be a bottleneck. You know, so the, the, the most important thing is that there's no way we could ever define all the, all the types and groups that, that ever exist in the, in the system. Um, you know, we're not intending to. We're just trying to give a strong enough set of them so that sort of as people extend them, they sort of understand, oh, yeah, this makes sense to add this one. This is, a, you know, is another kind of the, of the three that were listed when the services came up with the types and whatnot and, and, and cleared that, um, as, as we'll talk about later on with the, with the business analysts. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is, there is to allow 
so all of the parallel development teams just to, to go ahead and start managing and modifying the types. Um, and, there, and there is a, a, a process, which actually I didn't include here, about you know, at least not notifying services, so we, we can sort of review them and sort of just keep an eye on it to make sure somebody doesn't create a, a kind of a, a crazy type that, that doesn't fit the overall scheme. Because very often we could say, well, no, no, what you're trying to do here really maybe was better to be done on this, on this other object down here or something like that. So, but you know, feel free to move ahead. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that you know, types are used at, at class one and class two services a little bit, a little bit differently. But a lot of people have this idea that class one services um, and class two services, you know, they're, they represent a single type. Um, but in reality, it, it's really just a matter of degree in that the class two services often represent a single type, but not all the time. So for example, you can run through there um, the, the term object, which is really you know, a, a representation of certain kinds of ATPs underneath, um, really represents fall term, spring term, and summer terms, or, or winter terms, or whatever. So the, same, so the same term object can actually represent multiple kinds of things at the, at the class two level. It isn't just taking the type at the class one level and making it a concrete object at the class two level. So of course, you know, the, the, the immediate question jumps to mind is, well, well, why do we have the type on the class two at all? Um, and as you saw, you know, well, we already have this thing called a, a course. You know, why do you have this, you know, the type being credit course? And it just, again, the answer is, is extensibility. It, we wanted to be able to allow some school to configure possibly a non-credit course and use the same course service but be able to distinguish between their credit courses and their non-credit courses that they're, config that they're, they're um, authoring and managing through that same course service interface. So that's why we, you know, we, we, we have it. And although we only have, we're only publishing our reference with credit course, you know, it's not illegal or wrong for an implementing institution to add in their non-credit courses as a way of doing the same thing. Um, switching to states a little bit. <clears throat> Um, just want to talk about them, is that, you know, states take the, you know, look at it from the, you know, the other orthogonal view, you know, sort of types are what the thing is, and sort of the, the, the states are sort of when, or, and I just use the word where, but in, in, this, in this slide I'm looking at it, I really should use, you know, different, but where it is within some sort of predefined life cycle, but it has something to do with time, you know, and as you can sort of see, you know, it's like puppy, it's adolescent or whatever. Um, but again, sort of like types, you know, they, they define sort of expectations and, and, and what you can do with that object because you can do, you, you know, you can set it up so that, you know, people can make changes to a course while it's in draft state, but, you know, uh, or a course offering while it's, you know, store be, still being, you know, proposed or whether not being proposed but being, you know, planned. Um, you know, once it's been offered, you might want to lock it down and sort of say, no, you can't, you can't change the fields on that thing without some sort of a, you know, special override or something like that. So it, it, the states control sort of what you can do with that object within sort of its life cycle. Um, so it, it turns off requiredness of the field, sort of like types do, but this, you know, really more because it's, you know, it's where it is in its life cycle. Um, and it also controls, again, you know, rules for access. So you can sort of say that, uh, you know, retired courses can still be printed on transcripts, but you're not going to allow new registrations for them. Um, and things like that. You don't want to have draft stuff showing up on students' calendars, you know, stuff like that. So, um, so then, you know, one of the things that, that especially during R1 got people really confused was, um, and myself included here, <laughs> was mixing up workflow with, with states. Um, and, and actually, you know, if you pull back now, I think we've got a, a better view of this, is that they're related, but they're really different concepts. And that workflow really is more about the detailed approval node workflow routing level type of stuff. Um, but states are more like, you know, you know, what are the basic structures that this object in, you know, in, in general goes through? Not about how it goes through them because it may jump around and whatnot, but just what is it? So another way of saying it is, is that you actually use, will work, you actually use workflow to route something to get approved to, to actually change that the state, to make a change in the state of the object. So I'll just go through an example here. So, you know, you might create, you know, uh, a course initially as a, as a draft course, um, and then you submit it, right, and, you, and the state gets changed to, which, well, it's now a proposed course because you have to have certain things on the, on the uh, object, uh, certain fields filled in on the object in order to even submit it for, to be proposed. 
Um, but that's when workflow sort of takes over. And you then, as part of that same step where it changes for proposed, it's like workflow, you create a workflow for, that's a proposal for a, a, a new course, right? Um, and then it has to route through the departmental approval, the university approval, and there's maybe has a financial office approval, all kinds of stuff. And then when it's finally approved, that's when it's sort of the, you know, the workflow comes back and says, ah, you know, this thing is done. It's approved, and it marks the state and says that it's done. Um, and then sort of later on, you know, the course is offered, blah, 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 blah. You know, later on you can then see that the, you know, later on somebody may say, hey, you know, that course is getting a little long in the tooth. We want to retire it. Um, and so somebody may then submit a workflow proposal to retire it. Now, in this case, you, you know, the state of the object itself doesn't get changed just because the workflow gets submitted. But then it goes through the same approval pro or whatever approval process for retiring does. And when it finally gets approved to retire that course, then the workflow again reaches back in and says, hey, retire the course, the co mark the course as retired. So you can sort of see that it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's, a, multi, it's a different level. And I think if, if people think about it this way, I think we'll, be, we'll all be much happier. Because <laughs> in R1, it was a little confusing. Um, and then, you know, I've been using this word life cycle quite a bit. And, uh, you know, and, and just using it sort of, sort of loosely, but I want to get a little more, a little more precise about it. Um, and the precise is that it's just a, a collection of states. Um, that's all it really is. Um, there is no ordering to the states. There is no implied, you know, how you have to go through this life cycle. Um, from a business perspective, of course, you know, they want to sort of say this is how you might want, you know, typically go progresses and whatnot. But, you know, within, in the, from a programmatic standpoint, it's just a, a bag of, of states um, that, that, you, that you work through. Um, and if you, if you think about it, most of the objects, even though we put a state on every object, most of them just have two states, active and inactive. Um, but for more complex objects, especially the more abstract objects that we've got in the system, like you know, learning unit and LPR, which is Louis person relation and Louis and all this other kind of stuff, you, you actually may tie, have different states tied to the different type that's that you're that you, that's that's being pushed through. So, for example, the, the LPR manages, you know, basically it manages everybody's um, a person's relationship to a learning unit. So, if if the learning unit is a course and your relationship to it is a student, then the states you might go through would be planned, registered, and maybe dropped. You signed up, for, you plan to take the course, you register for the course, you drop the course, right? Um, then if you, but if you, if you switch down, I'm going to go to the, the, the third one, you know, if you're an, an instructor, you know, you really have different relationship to that course. You have, um, you know, possibly you've been tentatively assigned to the course, and then you are assigned to the course, and then maybe you're, you're removed from the course or unassigned from the course, um, at, you know, as an instructor assigned to the course. Um, and then similarly, you can sort of see, you know, that, that for, for if, if the, learning unit is actually a program, like a, like a major or a minor or something like that. You know, you may have applied to it, you may have get admitted, enrolled, and then maybe withdrawn from that. Um, and so you can sort of see that it, it, the life cycle doesn't attach directly to the object of actually, or the type, it actually maybe connects, I mean, it connects something to the object, sometimes to the, to the types that you're running into. And so for people who, I, I used the examples on the previous page, but I know some people just, you know, uh, learn uh, or understand this stuff visually. So I just wanted to throw out the object life. You know, this is just the uh, the state entity diagram, and so it just sort of shows you sort of how all the pieces are are sort of like linked together logically. And um, the only thing is, you know, as you can sort of say, is that the type of the object is only sort of loosely connected. There actually is no real strong connection. We don't have any programmatic connection between the type object and the um, and the life cycle. But you know. The, the ref object URI really that defines something like you know a, a learning unit or, or a course or, or some you know some object in the system, some, and then actually and this is always the hard part the, the object is the actual instance itself and then the life cycle just connects them all together. Um, but if you want to uh, later on ping me with questions on the diagram, but it sort of shows you how all the things are really connected. How we doing? Okay. I think we're doing good. Appel, do you want to ask your question or you want to let it go in the chat? All right. I'm going to switch over to the chat. Okay. Whoops. I think Appel, 
<laughs> okay. No, okay. He's, we're, we'll follow up later. Sorry. All right. So we have another. And our question that last item was um, yep. Was that just for illustrative purposes? No, that is actually the the entity diagram for okay. Okay. for for the state. So it's actually part of the published service. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understand if I, what you're what you're asking. So, is this by the virtue of the work? I, I think we're trying to sorry. get at here. <clears throat> So what I was curious about was that we have uh, basically these uh, particular types um, or selection of types that can apply to um, some particular process or workflow. Um, we don't have any kind of actual programmatic grouping for those, correct? I mean, it's just they only exist as some kind of um, not fully defined or realized. They just exist as because they're a particular workflow or process calls out um, those particular state changes? Right, exactly, exactly. They're, they're, so it's sort of you hard, you know, it, 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 when you would, let's say, create a, a workflow document, you would also sort of attach a code, you know, the, a code that would happen at the, when, when it gets to the approval state, and it, it marks, you know, it knows to take the, right. you know, ID of the object, and it knows to go into that, into the quality student and mark the object. If that's right. not done in any automatic way, it's sort of just, because you know you're using right. that. So we have like doc a design doc or something somewhere that says this is how it should work, and then it's up to the programmers to make sure that um, the workflow and the calls out and the, and the state changes work appropriately. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all that's I wanted to check. Stuff. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So not not hard. Not 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 programmatically linked. Yeah. Might might be something we want to do at some other time, but you know, not right now. We don't have that capability. So. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Cool. All right. So, so then, you know, you might have the same kind of question that, uh, you know, you know about rice. Well, geez, do, do, does rice have, have states too? Um, but, but they don't. Um, they, but most of their objects, not all of them, have, you know, what's called an is active flag. Um, so, and, and that's to my standpoint. You know, it's, it's sometimes it's harder to work with a state. It's easy just to check an is active flag. And if most of, the, as I said, on most of the simple objects. It's just a, you know a boolean yes you know yes is active um, so you know sometimes you know I, I, you, you sort of go oh, I wish it was but you know quality student you know we, we, we went with 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 full fledged states um, and when they looked at it they said yeah I agree it does apply would apply more you know for um, you know more complex objects and whatnot but you know we, we don't have time to make that change and we don't have time to sort of like replicate that out throughout the you know the system and get a, and whatnot. So they stuck with just their is active flags on the thing, um, that just the way it is. But you know, so they don't have something called state, but it's there's something similar to that on most of their objects. The the is active flag. Um, 